Hi everybody, welcome to Online Church. My name is Martin and it's a real privilege to speak today. We're in the last talk on our series in the book of John. Uh, we're finishing at John chapter 12. And so I'm going to read John chapter 12 verse 1 to 11 and then pray and we'll speak about it. So John chapter 12 and verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, thank you for your word and the way it points us to what devotion to Jesus can look like. And we ask, Lord, we become more aware today of how your incredible devotion to us changes everything. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. So if you've been with us in our series, the last verse in, in the end of chapter 20 tells us a, a central reason why John wrote this gospel. It says, but these are written that you may believe. Very important idea that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. His heart is that you would have life through Jesus, through believing in him. And believing in Jesus, we've got to understand today, is not just a moment. It's not just a singular moment in time. Sometimes we talk about crossing a line of faith as though it's just that moment. that You just say yes to Jesus once and that's it. But that's nothing of the sort. It's just the beginning of of a whole new way of life, a whole new way of seeing people, the world, God, yourself, a whole new way of existing. And that whole new life, it, it's not necessarily something that, that comes easy either. There's a whole lot of learning attached to that. And so in other words, maturity is not simply a product of time. And, and so you can um, have faith for a long time, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're growing deeper with God or, or, or actually learning more with him. My faith is not just a product of how long I've believed, but how much I'm devoted to Jesus. And that's what changes me. And it's a lot like the reality of love. So this year I've been married, uh, the end of this year, 28 years to my wife Martine. And I would say I love her far more deeply than when I first married her in 1994. But back in 1994, I, I loved her as best I could with everything I had then. But with all the ups and downs of life, and the ups and downs of our relationship, us being in sync, us being out of sync, me loving her in more shallow ways and then eventually more deeper ways. The reality is I can say there's more in me now. I have more to offer. It's the reality of my devotion to her has changed. It's changed me. It's changed us. And so this is connected to what, what happens in love and what happens in our devotion to Jesus. See, this is central to the book of John. See, many of us see relationships as two people coexisting, but remaining autonomous. You know, like I'm me, you're you, and who and what I am is not dependent on you. But you see, that's not what we see as essential to relationship in the book of John. You know, we've split the book in half. We've basically said our series is about the book of science, they call it, chapters 1 to 12. Chapter 13 to the end, which we talked more about at Easter, is really the book of glory, where we see the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. But there's other ways to actually break up the book. One of the very beautiful ways is to see all the parallel themes at the beginning and the ending of the book uh, work in concert. And it's called a chiasm where they, where they meet in the middle somewhere. 
But actually, in chapters 4 and 5 is the high point of that chiasm. And so what's really interesting, in chapter 5, Jesus speaks very openly, so much that they're offended by him, about how he only does what he sees the Father doing, that he's completely dependent on his Father. And this relationship of dependence with Jesus and devotion to his Father is essential to, to what it means to actually be in a relationship and believe in Jesus ourself. And, and so in all the Gospels, there's a different flavor. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospels, and they all have different strength and emphases to this relationship. But we learn about Jesus being the Son and relating to his Father, particularly in the book of John. For example, Jesus calls God Father, listen to this, four times in the book of Mark, six times in the book of Luke, 23 times in the book of Matthew, but 107 times in the book of John, our gospel today. And Jesus is given the title Son twice in the book of Matthew, once each in the book of Mark and Luke, and 18 times in our gospel John. So it's essential. This relationship between us, Jesus, and, and his Father is telling us something about our relationship to God. See, here's the question. What if there is a relationship that is so beautiful and perfect that to experience his reality would set you free to become who you most truly are. And that freedom that we long for exists only in a home to which you've been invited. See, the Gospel of John says that home exists, that home has existed for all eternity because the Father, Son and Spirit are inviting us into their home to shut the door on all the things that enslave us and take our place at the table. And it, this whole gospel is a profound picture of a relationship with God and what devotion to God looks like. And in this little story, we have got five examples of, of devotion to Jesus. Well, actually, not all to Jesus. We've got one different and four. We're going to see the contrast here. But we have pictures, actually, of single-minded devotion. And we're going to start with Judas. He's a standout, and he's here to teach us a very difficult lesson for us. You see, when he first responds to Mary's uh, display of costly love for Jesus, where she breaks this open, this, this jar of perfume, the whole jar, he gets mad that she does this. The whole year's wages, he says, wasted. He sounds like a good guy who cares about the poor, but John tells us that he doesn't. He's actually, this is not his real motive. Verse 6 said, he said this not because he cares about the poor, but because he was a thief. I mean, John is calling this guy out. He said he had charge of the money bag and he'd help himself to the money. So not only was Judas a greedy person, but he was what we call virtue signaling. You know, if you put in Google um, Daily Telegraph virtue signaling or Sydney Morning Herald virtue signaling, you'll see tons of articles about people who, all this moral grandstanding going on where people like Judas is doing here. He's, Judas is implying he has a higher, noble goal. But in fact, he's just greedy and proud. You know, he wants us to think that he's single-mindedly devoted to the poor, but actually, he's single-mindedly devoted to money. And he's so committed to money that, that, that he can disguise how he speaks about it, so it sounds like he's talking about something else. And so here, Jesus and the poor are a means to an end for him. This is a huge thing because it's, it's so easily is rewarded on social media today. You know, virtue signaling is rewarded because so many people on your social media platform don't actually know your real life. The other challenge for us is, is that if you, it happens a lot in the church. And if you've been watching the, the stories of scandal coming out in the last few years of leaders who say one thing and live another way, you know, and, and, and really live in an unreality where they think the rules don't apply to them, they can do whatever to whoever. See, Judas creates a huge challenge for us. When we think about our devotion to God, we can sometimes do it without being honest about what we're really devoted to. You might be a Christian, but you might actually at times be more devoted to other things like money and the approval of others that we see in Judas. And it's a very subtle one with that. There's so many things that we go, oh, that's terrible, that's terrible, I'm not like them. 
you know, a lot of Christians that will, will openly pay out the, the, the gay, lesbian, Mardi Gras in Sydney. But live in homes, being in one of the richest countries in the world, that are really in themselves streets that are a Mardi Gras of greed, that is actually harder to notice. So, so what are we really devoted and committed to is a big question when you look at the character of Judas here at this banquet. See, Jesus sees through it and he says straight away, leave her alone. He says, I can see basically to Judas that your heart is not what you say it is. And if you your heart is really set on, on money and the approval of others, it's going to end badly for you. And in the very next chapter, he leaves the supper to betray Jesus. And, and John gives this, this eerie sign of it by saying, and it was night when he departed. He's really saying that Judas stepped into the darkness, expressing his single-minded devotion, not to, not to Christ, but to money and the approval of others. So this is our first expression of single-minded devotion here. It's a very big challenge to us. The second one is Martha. We'll look in verse 2. It says, Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour, and Martha served. Martha served. Um, uh, like Thomas last week, uh, Martha gets a really bad rap. Because this time I think, what, what's the, the first thing you think about when you think about Martha? You think, oh, okay, she's, she's busy, she's stressed out, she's uh, frustrated. And that's how she's remembered, isn't it? But you see, um, that, that's from a story in Luke chapter 10. But the point of that story wasn't that it's bad to serve, but it's actually good to listen to Jesus. And Martha shouldn't, shouldn't knock her sister for doing it. And in our story, it looks like Martha learned that lesson well. See, in chapter 11, the chapter just before this, Martha is the first one out of the home to welcome Jesus when he comes to the house after Lazarus had died. And when Jesus speaks to her about raising the dead, Martha is actually the first person in the whole Gospel of John to say actually who Jesus is. She, she says, yes, Lord, I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. So you see, John doesn't describe her as some sort of messed up, not really true or failed disciple, but a true disciple who took this to heart. And, and so, look, someone's got to do the cooking, don't they? Someone's got to plan it. Someone's got to organize it. And actually, in the next chapter, Jesus defines what following him and leadership in his kingdom looks like. And he does it through the lens of serving other people by washing his disciples' feet. That's incredible. So Martha is expressing her single-minded devotion to Christ by serving a meal, using her gifts to help others. Then we have Mary at the meal. Look at verse 3. It says, Mary, uh, where are we? I'm reading the wrong place. Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, we know this was an expensive thing because of Judas's complaint. He said it's a year's salary, 300 denarii. And because of one denarii is one day's wage. So it's about a year's salary for, for a, a laborer. And that's huge. Very costly act of devotion. And she's pouring this out on Jesus' feet. And we're told, this is, and we can see, this is actually a picture of what Jesus is actually going to do later for Mary, for all of them. He's going to pour himself out for them to actually cleanse their shameful parts, to make them into a beautiful fragrance. See, Mary's physically enacting what Jesus is going to do on the cross where he pours his life out to cleanse people of their sin. And, and people will marvel at it. Some people will complain about it. But Jesus will say, no, this is the best thing that I could do. And this is, this, see, what this is such a, a different contrast, isn't it? We have, we have Martha's very practical expression of devotion to Jesus. And now we have Mary's almost impractical, costly expression of devotion. But it's a picture of holiness. An incredible picture of many things, but especially of holiness, because of the unconditional nature of her devotion. You see, there's three things she does. She, she, she pours out the whole bottle of perfume. She pours it on Jesus' feet, secondly. And thirdly, she wipes his feet with her hair. 
And these bring together a powerful picture of her unconditional commitment to Jesus. This is very important. It's like no holes barred. Um, at banquets in their day, you've got to understand something about it. It was pre-running water, but not pre-body odor. So in other words, they found it to be able to enjoy a great banquet because of the reality of smelly feet and, and smelly bodies. Whereas you come into the banquet, you, you, someone would put some fragrance on your face, on your head, and you'd be enveloped with the scent of those spices. And she poured the whole jar out. So the whole room, the whole home is enveloped with the fragrance. So, so it's, it's incredible what she's expressing, isn't it? You can be almost certain this is an heirloom that is passed down. It would have been for their family at their hedge against disaster. If things went bad or famine, it was what was going to help them. It's all poured out. And she pours on his feet, which was in their day a demeaning part of the body, a sort of humiliating thing to wash or wipe or someone's feet. And then she does it with her hair. Huge as she does it with her hair. For a woman to unbound or loosen her hair in public was shameful there. It was seen as a scandalous thing. And so really what she's saying, so many things. One, she's saying she, she's not, she's going to serve him regardless of her rights because she didn't have to touch anyone's feet. She, she, really, even servants in, in servitude paying off a, a debt weren't required necessarily to, to touch someone's feet. And, and, and so she's saying, I'll serve you and with my hair. No matter what you say, no matter what you send, she's actually saying, I'm going to give you all that I have and all that I am. It's an incredible picture of single-minded devotion to Jesus. The third picture we have here um, of Lazarus, his devotion to Jesus. Um, listen to the description of Lazarus. It says, six days at the beginning before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at table. He was there reclining at table. Now, this guy had a crazy few months. He, he was dead in a tomb, and now he's alive. He's been raised from the dead. How do you put that together in your head? How do you, how do you talk about it? How do you explain the experience? It's crazy. It's really crazy. Uh, I mean, he's a well man. By the way, dad joke warning. What do you call a man who's left the hospital? Manuel, sorry. But the fact is, he was a man who's well. And, and he, he's got a story for the rest of his life. The whole town's coming to hear this. How does it happen that he's so well? How does it happen that, what was that like? But what he is, actually, he's a picture of every Christian. All of us were actually dead in the tomb. We didn't even have faith. And the voice of Jesus summoned us, like summoned Lazarus. Lazarus, come out. And death broke into life broke into his death, and he's now alive. That's the story of every Christian. That's our story. And the testimony of Lazarus was bringing people to Jesus, and that's how God intended that our testimonies would be an expression of devotion to Jesus, because it'll bring people to Him. Um, Lazarus is is basically surfing, like we said last week, the resurrection. It's a picture. In, in John's gospel of surfing on God's grace. Um, a, a good friend of ours uh, lost his mum uh, many years ago and uh, a lot of people talked to his dad asking him in the next year how he's going, how he's going. And his expression for how he's journeying with not only the tragedy and loss but all the support he was receiving, he says, all I can say is I'm surfing on God's grace at the moment. That was a phrase that stuck with me. And I think it, I see it here that Lazarus is serving on God's grace, wanting to just recline at table with him, just to enjoy to be with him. You see, his expression of single-minded devotion to Jesus was to recline with him, to enjoy the presence of his Lord. So sometimes single-minded devotion will look like diligent, unsung service. Sometimes it'll look like costly, sacrificial love. And sometimes it'll look like just being with Jesus. So like Martha, here we are called to serve, serve God with faithfulness as our King. Like Mary, we are called to worship God with abandon as our Saviour. And like Lazarus, we are called 
to, recl to, to recline in the presence of the Lord as our friend. I think this is a profoundly helpful passage to think about our devotion to Jesus. Because those three things are what Jesus does for his people. The very next chapter, he washes their feet, an act of service. And then on the cross, he's pouring his life out, a costly act of love. And in the last chapter, he's reclining with them, breaking on the beach. Amazing expression of friendship. And you see, this helps me understand better what it means to be devoted to Jesus because my devotion to Jesus is meant to be a response to his devotion to us, to his devotion of service, of sacrifice, and of friendship. And, and this is really what, what leads me to say our whole life with God is a process. It's a whole new life. It's a whole new relationship. And, and when you talk about single-minded, when I was younger, the church I grew up in maybe was never, ever intended like this. But often what I heard was that it was a singular focus. And what you need to focus on is that quiet time in the morning, that, that, that it's, you know, no Bible, no breakfast. Now, that is actually a noteworthy and noble thing to do. Uh, but if you're not a morning person, if you're a night owl, that, that's a problem, right? What does it mean to have single-minded devotions? devotion to Jesus, it doesn't mean clearly one thing. It clearly doesn't mean one thing. And, and I want you to stop and notice and reflect on what it might look like for you in your life to express single-minded devotion to Jesus in your service to others. That's going to look different. In, in your costly love and uh, worshipping him with abandon, what's that look like? It's going to look different. And, and, and with actually... Um, Spending time in the presence of Christ, that's going to look different again, isn't it? It's so important to notice that. See, I'm a person who craves new learning, craves curiosity. And, and, and so sometimes I'm interested in this and I'm interested in that. And it's not necessarily an unfocused life because of how my mind works. Because here's the thing. The word focus comes from the imagery of a of a hearth, of a fireplace, a fireplace that has a burning center that fuels and guides that life. It's guided by a passion for the one who's devoted to us. And we need to see that in a very, I think, everyday way. What could it look like to enjoy, like Lazarus, the presence of our Lord at work? What could it look like to enjoy at our workplace, serving God, or even expressing costly worship to Jesus? What could it look like to serve others at our home, to enjoy the presence of Jesus in very everyday, ordinary ways? See, this idea of belief that John has been on about all through his book to try to show us pictures of belief and unbelief, it's huge. And, and we have the challenge really the caution of Lazarus, I mean, um, Judas Iscariot in this passage, the one who wants to make it look like he's devoted to good things, but actually he's just about money and the approval of others. And, and that's a really good challenge to have in there because the reality is, is this journey of life with God, for us, it's a slow journey. It, it, it doesn't necessarily look spectacular. It's so important to see. It's life-giving. It literally helps us become who we were created to be, but we have to we have to we have to right size it because it's a human size life. In other words, it, I'm going to say this in this way: analogy of sport here. It looks more like a soccer game than a basketball match. You know, I heard years ago that Americans hate soccer. The reason why they hate soccer is because they love the big points. They love the scoreboard being big, right? So they go to a basketball match and they love basketball. It's fast-paced and it's a high scoring. So 130, 124 is a great match. But if they go to a basketball match and the, and the score is like 70 to 65, they think, what a boring game. But you see, 140 points were scored. That's not boring in terms of points. But they're after the big score. They don't appreciate the process. Soccer. My son watches soccer every single night. And, and it can be nil all. It can be double overtime. <laughs> and, and, 
Zoe's got 90 minutes and 30 minutes and now nil all. And now it's going to a penalty shootout. How can you watch a game for two hours and have nobody score? It's because you actually appreciate the beauty of the process. And that's why soccer is called the beautiful game. You see, I reckon our life with God is more like a 0-0 zero, zero match. So much more like Because great things don't necessarily come easy or often. This process is a thing to notice because it's a process of stepping into the freedom of God's love. And it changes us like any relationship, but it's the most profound relationship. So maybe what God desires is not so much that the world sees our amazing success, but get to experience something of a life well lived, of the beauty of of a life well lived in devotion to Jesus because of his devotion to us. What a great passage. Hey, let, let, let's pray together. Uh, Father God, we thank you for your devotion to us, your service, your sacrifice, and your friendship. Each of those categories are incredible for us to explore. We ask you would help us to become more aware of your presence and activity in our lives that we might enjoy more of your presence in the everydayness, the ordinary things. They change nature. When we recognize that you have devoted yourself to us with this unconditioned love in Jesus, in service, sacrifice, and friendship. We ask God that that would change something in us, that we would recognize belief is not just a moment, but a whole new way of life in relationship to you. Our perfect Father, we thank you for what you've given us. Thank you for the freedom of your love and how it opens the door for us to not just experience your devotion to us, but actually for us to actually live a life of devotion to you. We ask your help in that in Jesus' name. Amen.